Thanks for being here today. And uh, I, am, um, I don't take your presence here for granted, and I want to uh, take some time and share with you coming up uh, tomorrow night. Tonight we have a, our board meeting, uh, 30, I think it's 34. I always get the number wrong, and I apologize, but we're in the 30s of a shared governance model that we have. So we have deacons and deaconesses that um, minister to the body and work with Pastor Clinton Claire and Holly Potter and and um, and helping uh, minister to you and, and just a lot of the nuts and bolts that, that goes into the ministry here week after week. Uh, and then we have um, the trustees that are the fiduciary um, watchers uh, over everything, all of the, the budgets and everything that come through there. And then we have a group of elders that uh, just cover uh, us, cover our family in prayer, cover you in prayer, cover the vision of what we believe God is saying uh, in prayer and, and carry it. And, and uh, so um, it's a big deal tonight. All of the, all those groups will be together and, and uh, we're going to take communion tonight. So it's, it should be a wonderful uh, gathering this evening. Praying for a direction tomorrow night, then um, it's not just members only, but it is uh, just an informational meeting to catch you up on the activity of the board this last year. Uh, and, uh, but I thought today I would go through some of those things that we're going to hit in more detail tomorrow night um, and just kind of give you an overview of all that's going on. Um, much that, uh, a lot that is happening um, has uh, relates to the sale of our property, so I thought I would just bring you up to date since uh, I've been uh, not able to update you holistically, so I'm able to speak to that today, and, and uh, what we've said is, and the little logo that you'll be seeing next uh, year, uh, early in 2020, is that the, the time is now, it's just time to go. Uh, we're going to get on with the mission and the vision and all that uh, God has been speaking to us over this last decade, and we're very excited. I thought it would be good to kind of understand where we are in the process, like what is our timeline, what's the frame. So the very first thing we've been doing is uh, we've been in a time of prayer uh, about it all, and then uh, we are now headed to the close of the property. I think the property will close within uh, 60 days, so you can kind of uh, mark your calendar on that. It, it, it potentially could close much sooner, but, uh, but probably 60 days will get us there. The delay that we went through was to... Uh, for the most part, was to navigate the use of. So we're going to uh, sell the uh, property and the facilities um, to the purchaser, and then what is their access to use uh, Monday through uh, Saturday? What does that look like? And and uh, so that we had uh, quite a bit of work to do on that that um, that we needed to do. And so so now that that's been complete, and uh, all parties feel comfortable with where we're at. Um, so we'll close on the property. As soon as that happens, right after that, we will select a property. Now, one of uh, Pastor Clint's literally full-time assignment, he is uh, continually scoping out properties, uh, looking uh, all driving the city, uh, looking. He has found uh, uh, places for us to uh, pray about. Some have, have uh, not turned out uh, uh, to be what we felt like was God's will, and so we're continuing to look. And so we have not selected a place yet. We're very much in prayer about that and keep us in prayer uh, related to that. But um, that's what will happen, and then we'll move into a design and build. We'll engage with an architect. Um, we'll, we'll interview several architects and find the best one that can kind of uh, encapsulate who we are and kind of pull it all together. Uh, we don't know at this point, are we buying just a piece of green land or are there buildings there that we need to make decisions on, whether we're going to keep some of the older buildings or, or what, what does all that uh, look, alike, uh, look like and then um, how do we think about is this, is this an area we want to be careful in because uh, um, you know, of certain um, factors as far as um, making sure we don't displace uh, any uh, things that are happening there ministry-wise and stepping on other ministries and so it's a complicated process and so that uh, that will happen, and once we once we find that, then we design and build something, uh, and then you'll hear probably next year this time you'll hear about some giving initiative that we bring uh, bring we bring to you. So what what to watch for? Uh, so a couple of buzzwords for you to think about, uh, and that is when you hear this, when you hear visionary planning council, uh, these are uh, folks are being nominated and ratified by the board. Uh, by the entire board now, 
uh, as we begin to select a council of, the, of church members who will help provide oversight uh, moving forward uh, on both the selection of property and how that uh, in, incorporates all the vision and, and uh, the proceeds from the sale and all those kinds of things. And also uh, something that would be a little bit more uh, interesting probably to most of you, facilities and campus infrastructure committee, uh, things about, you know, what are, we, what are we thinking about on campus as far as athletics and security and these kinds of things. And so there'll be various subcommittees uh, that will, uh, you'll be able, if you don't um, jump in on any of the subcommittees, uh, you'll be able to say, oh, I know who, who is uh, over that or leading that and, and hand your idea. I know that, you know, churches are notorious for fighting over the color of carpet. So pick your color now and you know, get your ammo ready, and you'll fight with these people. I'm not on this committee, so uh, y'all, we'll let y'all fight it out, and you know, come out with a the, the color smurple or something, what, whatever uh, that looks like. But just those are buzzwords. Uh, keep watching for that, and uh, keep that in mind. Um, should you come to uh, to Winston Salem first and bring somebody else? Well, you should come, and uh, when you do, we want you to feel closer to God. That everyone in uh, in the room at some moment in their life will need help from God, and we commit to helping you take those requests to God. And uh, the truth is we want everybody to feel the peace uh, and joy of experiencing God's presence. We'll help uh, you deepen your personal connection to God. These are all reasons why you would invite others to be a part uh, of our church family. Uh, Win Salem First will help you in two main ways. These are kind of the two big things we care about that people would have an experience with the Lord and encounter the Lord, and secondly, that you would engage in helping us to bless the city. Um, remember in 2008, we launched Christmas for the City, and then um, that next year, um, through a series of events, uh, God uh, um, helped us to reach to uh, Chuck, Chuck and Sarah Spong, and they came to town and took what was just a, uh, an event uh, Christmas for the city and and um, turned it into ministering as a church. We ministered all year long to the various needs of the city. And then um, just a few years ago, we helped them launch out on their own. They're now their, their own 501c3 uh, and uh, have their own board. I'm not on that board uh, nor any uh, um, in any official capacity, but we are very engaged. We'll all um, be a Christmas for the city. Hopefully you will and jump in and bake cookies and do whatever. I think we're going to host the uh, gift mart or at least help with uh, collecting uh, gifts for the gift mart and things like that. Uh, but anyway, all of that, the, that number two part is say, hey, we want everybody, we want to help you provide simple steps to be engaged uh, with the city. <clears throat> while, I, while we were away <clears throat> taking a, um, a little time uh, we went on with the campaign that we had uh, launched or uh, planned all summer or back in the spring, actually, called It Starts With You. So all of your data, uh, well, some of your data, we didn't get all of your data, but uh, probably participation was about 75%, I think. Uh, we had 968 people that participated in the survey. And so I'm going to give you some preliminary data uh, right here that we learned from the survey. Um, some incredible news, and that is this, that the men at WSF uh, is much greater than the national average. 44% 40 of our attenders are male. Isn't that awesome? That's incredible. You know, I don't know if you've followed church culture over the last few decades, but it's like, oh, it's just a bunch of old women at that church. Not, not at our church. You know, the national average is in the low, I think it's 31%. I saw a recent poll from Duke University and uh, our Pew Research uh, so we are blowing that away, and so thank you to all you men who make an effort. You know, I would want to raise my kids in a church where, where they see uh, real, authentic men doing their best to follow Jesus and coming to church every week, and uh, this, is a great, this is a great place to, to bring your families for sure. Uh, the range of adults, uh, there are the breakdown really of our congregation uh, is uh, pretty amazing, um, here, here's the breakdown. Go to the next slide because I break it down real easy. I have to have things in uh, uh, real simple steps. Uh, the zero, there we go. The zero to 34, uh, that 34 year span, we have 26% of attenders uh, are there. The 35 to 49 group, which I, I am so disappointed I'm not a part of that group anymore. I can't tell you the shock. When I saw the numbers, I went, oh, I'm no longer in that group. 
I, that was a scoop to me for some reason, but uh, 32% are there. Look at, the, look at the balance here. And then the, the 50 and up, uh, 42%. So, uh, you know, I know that, you know, you get, when you're a leader, you get criticized. So one of the critis- criticisms is I ran off all the old people. Uh-uh, we still here. We still here. And uh, while I'm saying that, I want to give a shout out to the Legacy Sunday School class today for giving up Room 100 and allowing the babies uh, to, to uh, be talking about there. Would you say thanks to the Legacy class? We love you guys. Thank you, Pastor Elwood and Glenna. They said, sure, no problem. So we, we had a hot water heater burst over here, and the, all the men were on the retreat by the river. There's a joke in there somewhere down by the river. And the river broke out of a, uh, an old water heater over here and flooded the, the baby area. So we're hoping to be back online next Sunday. We'll keep you posted. Pastor Clint's keeping me posted on all that. But uh, uh, praise the Lord for church insurance. Hallelujah. So you're not having to, you're not having to do that. So, uh, so all, the, it's got all new flooring and everything and all the testing for asbestos and all that has happened. There's no... Nothing back there. It's all clear and good, so we're ready to, to, to uh, get engaged again back there. So, so that's going to happen. But uh, I, I wanted you to see that 50 and up, you know, that's, a, that's a bigger than a 34-year span. That's larger than that. So basically, you see a very balanced church. And what we've said is that we, we are a very multicultural, multi-generational church. We have all ages that are part. I think this is the way it should be. Can we give God praise for that? That's one of the most exciting things. Some of the goals we had to train and mentor the youngest disciples, uh, to encourage biblical literacy. Uh, these are all goals that we have. We have 10 main goals uh, set out. I'm just kind of highlighting them as, as we come across a connection. Here's an interesting stat. I came across the under 18 ministry breakdown that um, 30%, 38% in the elementary age there. Uh, and then if you take the uh, high school and middle school, put that together, that's 37%. Uh, so it's an, another incredible balance uh, going on here of ministry. And uh, something that I wanted to mention, something that we paid for out of our uh, uh, tithes and offerings and, and uh, things moving forward, and then some help designate, we raised about $100,000 on the side for uh, the, um, all of the new stuff, the treehouse, all the things you see will be going with us to our new location. Uh, that total came to this year, uh, we spent $257,744 on uh, really kind of step up and, and fight for our young people to say, no, we want you to come to church. We want those kids so excited that they badger their parents to death to get them to church on Sunday so they can climb in a treehouse. I hope it's working. I think it is. And attendance shows that it is. So uh, thank you for that. But thank you for that quarter of a million dollars because uh, that that's quarter of a million we're not going to have to spend when we get to our new location that we will uh, take. And, and all of those purchases were made with that in mind. So, uh, so excited about that. When it comes to race at Winston-Salem First, we are 52% uh, identify themselves on the survey as white, 32% black, uh, and there's the 5% Hispanic, uh, 2% Asian, Pacific Islander, 2% other, and 6% said, no, I'm not going to answer that. So uh, if you break all that down, it, absolutely, we are the most multicultural uh, church in, in the city and maybe the state. It's pretty, these, certainly in our denomination, it's a staggering uh, that we can't find any other church that, this, that is uh, um, so um, balanced uh, to almost where, where, where you're almost at 50-50 with uh, Caucasian versus everybody else. So uh, we're very, very uh, excited. And, and we thought that was true. We felt like that was true. Those numbers were true. Uh, but uh, we're glad, and, the, and those numbers are reflected in leadership. I share with you, I, I, for sake of time, I, I didn't go through our, our board breakdown, but our, the vice chairman who works closely with me uh, um, is uh, African-American. The first African-American vice chair, pastor is chair by virtue of position according to our bylaws, and the first African-American uh, vice chair at our church, Greg Brewer, serves on many boards in our community, and we're just so blessed as a church to say, you know what, we are, we are a different kind of a group and moving forward. So um, all, all of that. Another goal that we had is to offer programs to foster reconciliation and harmony as modeled by Jesus Christ. And um, so that will be coming, as you see, we're just kind of getting into that. Another stat that I'm just pulling out, and there'll be an official, we'll do an official 
chat through all this, but these are just pastor looking in my, uh, through my eyes. But um, the uh, families, we, we are reaching families uh, 60, let me see, because my eyes are getting a little shifty there. 64% uh, of, of our church are family units. There it is, 64%, 25% single, 7% divorced, 3% widowed, 1% separated. So you can see that our single, divorced, and widowed uh, ministries uh, need to step it up, that we're going to have to uh, pay a little bit more attention to what's going on in their lives and how can we minister to what's going on uh, there. But we're, we're very, uh, very thrilled to be reaching families and, and we definitely see a greater need for our widows and widowers to keep uh, those in mind. Now some say, okay, what about the school and all that happened? What's the bottom line? All the financial reports are in, the audited financial reports from, um, uh, from Villani and Becker. Uh, are in. We'll be sharing more details of that last night, but uh, the grand sum total this year that, uh, that you gave out of tithes and offerings is $564,938.05. That's what you gave to the school. This does not uh, have any other monies need to be subtracted from that. So if you want to call it rent, you could call it rent. If you want to call it, they covered their cleaning costs. They covered their cleaning costs. This is the, this is the bottom line. This does not include uh, what we have committed both to give back all the rent right now that, uh, that they are setting aside as well as the purchaser of our property is going to do the same, uh, whoever is, is in, in the chair when all that happens, that'll all go back. Uh, and also as a church, we've committed to give all the school desks, all the chairs, chalkboards, all the stuff over there uh, that, uh, to the school so that they will get that. So this, that number, uh, if you count chattel property, could go up significantly as well. But I, I think you should give yourselves a hand for just saying we love and pray for the school and we're invested in, uh, in who they are. So we're believing that God's going to help them uh, moving forward. Uh, the task force 2013, we launched that coming out of a 700,000, 770 if I remember the exact number. Uh, in 2012, uh, deficit, we actually sold a piece of property to, that we could not use that didn't fit where we were going in vision wise. Sold that to help offset the, um, uh, that deficit. But that uh, we launched, I launched this pastoral task force. You voted them in. They came back with three main uh, things. Number one, to restructure the church governance. They said, you know, um, seven guys sitting in the back room making big decisions, that should not be. There should be more. So make your governance inclusive and diverse. So we have females and uh, very culturally diverse as well uh, in the governance now. Number two, cease funding, release, re release that. It's an unsustainable model for us as a church. We're losing uh, um, so much. We're investing every year. We did it for 40 years, but it doesn't, the task force said, this does not going to carry us moving forward. We don't have that uh, kind of cash flow that we can support uh, Christian education in that way. And so uh, we voted the timelines on the next page, not going to go through it. This is all public knowledge, but um, in 012, the crisis started, task force, missional rediscovery that come back. You, uh, we gave them a nonprofit board in 015. 016, we voted as a church unanimously to release the school. Then on a Sunday morning in 2017 at 9 a.m., uh, we also voted again a year later just to make sure we're all on the same page and uh, so all that's been there. Then the third thing the task force came back and it impacts all of us today which is be open to selling the facility. And uh, so we're, we're doing that. The neighborhoods have moved and changed and all of that. So we are uh, focused on uh, what God has for us moving forward. So our three main spaces that we're going to build a meeting space, a playing space. We want a playing space not just for children, but even an area for senior adults that could come through the week. They could exercise or uh, sit down in the air conditioning and, and uh, fellowship and, and not to have to have a plan. They could just come to the campus. If they're, Many of our seniors are alone all through the week and have no way to interact, and we just feel like uh, having a campus available to them as well as young moms, young dads, or older moms, older dads that could bring their kids to a safe place. And then a helping space. So how are we going to help? We're going to continue to engage with all the nonprofits. But we're not, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're not creating a dream center. We're not going to be handing out food or clothes on campus like that. We will, we will, ultimately, our vision is that we would provide workers for all those 101 nonprofits. And, and Love Out Loud, of course, 
uh, and all that they're already doing, that we would just engage with what God's already doing in the city. Can you say amen? But a helping space and, and a ministry space like that. So uh, one of the goals is to implement a business plan that sustain these programs, provide opportunities to serve, meet the needs of the city, to connect people for meaningful friendships. All those things are important. Uh, and uh, Acts 2.42 says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions, belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This whole group that I just read to you about, they relocated. Because they all worshiped in the temple, and then Jesus came and blew all that up. So now they met in homes and gathered. It's more organic. It's more connected. And I, and I know that's what God has for us moving forward. So, uh, you know, one, one of the things, one of the deposits that Whitney left to us, and one of the goals that she fought for in staff meeting and in the, in the board meeting when we were uh, going through this was that we would be a place to continually host the presence of God, that the presence of God was, was our gift to the city, that the presence of God could flow through us, whether it was through uh, seniors having coffee or children playing on the big giant playground that we're going to have or whether it was in the services or, or a, a nightly gathering, whatever it might be that the presence of God would be there. Uh, Whitney also had her hand in this. You'll notice this next one as a goal. Respect God's world and our bodies by offering healthy food and drink options on a low-waste campus. So all you sugar holics, you will not be able to get a triple-decker double chocolate milkshake on our campus. We, you'll, have to, you'll have to go across the street wherever we're at, okay? Uh, here, what we're going to try and do is model, uh, model both in our bodies and also on campus uh, that, that we're respecting all that God's created and everybody said, oh me, oh me, yes, I all need to make changes. I'm going to ask the ushers uh, to come forward if they would, um, as we're going to take those regular Sunday morning tithes and offerings. Look, this is what I, I mean, I've had a lot of time to do some thinking, and here's what I've come to see. You're a great church. I don't even think you realize how great you are. You're, you're a great church. And this morning, I just want to build your faith a little bit. I want to encourage you. Uh, that we are, uh, the reason we invested for 40 years in Christian education is because we saw that as the best way to build people. We weren't interested in building buildings for ourselves. That was money well spent. Those graduates and, and kids that attended uh, through those years are making incredible differences where they are. And, um, and so all of the gifts uh, matter and all of these things count as we think about moving forward. But I want to challenge your faith today, obviously with the kind of numbers I've thrown out, the, both with our remodel numbers and, and uh, uh, what we've done for the school this year, our savings is depleted. So whatever you had in mind that you were going to give today, I'm asking you to add to that. Would you do that? Would you just give your uh, uh, heart a chance to hear what the Lord is saying? And for some of you, maybe it's to add uh, $100 or $1,000 or $10,000. Would you just respond our time away? Uh, our offerings went down about, a, I think it was about 120000 didn't come in uh, during our absence. So I want to make up that difference as, as soon as we can because we budgeted for that. And, and, uh, and, and so everything you give. But beyond that, I kind of wanted to challenge your faith to say, you know what? You say, Pastor, I didn't miss any of the weeks you were gone. I have been given sacrificially. I think you may be the person I'm talking to the most to, to say, you know what, help us. Let's believe God for a little bit more, and uh, I'm counting on you uh, to do that. Proverbs 29 says, where there is no vision, the people perish, or that Hebrew word is rot. Where there, where there is no vision, uh, the people will, will rot away with nothing to do, which is what I think uh, is easy to do in, in contemporary American Christian culture. But we are not that kind of a church. We are rich in vision. God has given us an incredible vision of, of how he wants to use us, how he wants to engage with us. So your giving today will help, help make, make that happen. Lord, thank you for the people watching online that are uh, giving. And thank you, Lord, for those that are in the room that are giving and those especially that are giving extra today uh, to help us. I pray, God, that you will uh, bless them. I pray that our faith would just... Be increased as we think about uh, all of the 
good things you have done. We are grateful. We have gratitude in our heart for all those things, and we acknowledge it today. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you for um, your faithfulness. Well, that was, uh, that was about five minutes too long, but we got through it. I apologize. But I just wanted to give you uh, an update um, on um, kind of the practical side and what things are going. So that will uh, help you to, uh, uh, to know uh, and listen for all that's coming uh, down the, uh, the pike here in just a little bit. You know, while the, the team were leading and uh, Vanjie did uh, just such an incredible job, along with the whole team up here, so grateful for their heart for the Lord and all the energy and effort they put in to, to bring us the Lord's uh, presence and these songs week after week. But uh, today, especially today, uh, you know, I can still hear Whitney's voice uh, on the stage. I can still see her passion and her love for God and uh, how much that she loved to be in his presence. I, I think even sadder uh, than the cancer was her inability to, to be here the last eight months and, and lead in worship uh, because she loved to worship her Lord. Uh, and, um, and so we... Uh, we miss her, and today I'm uh, continuing this little series. We've just called it Wit. It's just a way that uh, I've been able to um, kind of articulate some of the values that uh, that she left for us, but uh, also then thinking through uh, what does this mean for us moving forward. So today's message would be the most practical of the three so far uh, when it comes to what about you, what about what's going on in your life. Many of you are going through things uh, and, and um, hundreds of you are going through things, that uh, notes that you've written and emails you've sent uh, of just incredible suffering and loss and, and change and trouble and all of that. And, and, uh, and so I'm hoping that today, my desire is that today's message would, would be a strength to you. And I, I want it, I want it to, to be that. Uh, the W today is going to stand for what is my purpose in this life? to connect things with your purpose. What is your purpose uh, in this life? Here's a stat that, uh, uh, that One Hope put out, uh, our missions organization that, that we are close to, uh, put this out this week, and I, and I knew it went with a message, and I grabbed onto it because it's so shocking. But the suicide uh, death rates have soared and have outpaced. They're on the rise as homicide rates go down. I just want you to get your mind around that for a moment, that what it means for a church, the emotional and mental trauma going on uh, in, uh, in people's hearts and minds is so dramatic uh, that it has contributed to the, the uh, surge, really, in the uh, suicide rate. Uh, this is both a, uh, and it's almost a decade long now, 2000 to 2017. So it's a, there's a very serious trend we're watching here. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, legislation will not be able to touch the suicide rate. Uh, I don't care what your politics is. I really don't care. Uh, you know I'm an independent. I don't in, engage and get into that. But irregardless, the suicide rate won't go up or down depending on who is in office or not in office. I want you to see that is, that is a direct uh, calling to the American church to step up and really minister to people where they're at and not be screaming at them on a Sunday morning. That we need to engage with what people are going through. Can you say, man, I think, that, I think that's true. And I, I think people are so wounded and hurt and going through things. And uh, the book I read about two years ago called um, Suffering and the Heart of God by uh, Ph.D. Diane Langberg. It's the most incredible book on suffering that I've ever come across. And amazing. But in that book, there was this one line two years ago that impacted me. And little did I know that we would be living it. But she said, uh, trauma will be the greatest mission field uh, of the next century. That uh, as a church, you know, we've got to be able to minister to those that go through traumas. Uh, we, we're in baby steps, so we're launching our chaplains program, though we're not even really off the ground. We're just getting going as their own uh, pastors are, are, you know, coming through our trauma now and, and all of that. But we will. We're getting our, we're getting our footing and, and uh, getting prepared for all that God wants to do in the city. 
But I will tell you, I believe God wants to work on you and traumas that you've been through so that you're able to help and minister to others who have gone through similar things just like you. You know, we had uh, in the first service, uh, uh, who now has become a friend of mine, uh, but, uh, one of, uh, a veteran uh, who lost his leg and um, uh, has worked through that and, and now gives back and has a profession where he gives back and, and ministers. Uh, we had someone in our uh, church, one of our seniors lost, uh, lost uh, both of her legs uh, recently, and he was able to just minister to her to speak. And he said, you know, it's not that healthcare professionals don't know what she's going to experience, but there is nothing like talking to somebody who's also lost a limb that can speak to uh, what she's going to go through. And he's kept a check on her and watching. But I'm saying all that to say the same would be true probably for many of you, the trauma of divorce, the trauma of, of a loss of a business or whatever, that God wants to use that, that, that somehow that will fit into your purpose and who you are. I, I certainly didn't want, uh, we didn't want to, to carry this, um, this loss that we're carrying and be able to minister to, to people that uh, have lost children. You don't, know, you don't know the depth of that pain until you've, uh, until you've had that experience. And the same would be true for whatever you're going through. You know, this uh, past week we were with uh, Claire and Clint at a minister's convention, and, and uh, one of the nights they uh, invited all of those ministers that are going through something that need prayer to come down, and, and, uh, and so both husbands and wives, sometimes the wife is the pastor, sometimes the man is the pastor, and, but I went down and I was, I was watching them weeping. There was probably maybe 60 or so, I don't want to exaggerate, probably 60, maybe more, that were down front, and some were just heaping and weaving, like you could just see the pain that they were going through. Uh, and uh, unless you've been in their skin and know what they're feeling and going through. But I, I, did, I, didn't, uh, I didn't go down for prayer, not because I, I don't need prayer. I need prayer every day. Keep me in your prayers. Keep us and, uh, and Braden and Heather and Alan in your prayers. But I, I did look at them and think, there was a time when at these pastors' conventions that I would respond to that because I thought, oh my goodness, you know, the church is 700,000 in the red. This is awful. This is how we're going to do. That, that's nothing compared to losing a child. There's, there's nothing. Been, I'm at the dead end of the road now. That, I mean, even Facebook can't hurt my feelings from here. You know, this, this, is, this is as deep as it gets right here. This is as deep as it gets. And so what I realized is my capacity to handle stuff has been carved out and is larger because this, this pain is, is significant. Well, that same truth, translate that into your life, whatever you've been through, whatever your story is, whatever it is you're going through. And I, I think the W in that point is to ask, what is, what is my purpose? How, how might God you know, use this? Uh, think about it this way. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, pastor from the time of Hitler, said this, we must learn to regard people less in light of what they do or omit to do and more in light of what they suffer. In other words, if we could, if we could approach the city from a place to say, you know what, you know, I've suffered this, I've suffered the loss of a business, if we could, if we could meet them at their point of suffering, I think that, that mission field is wide open. I don't think there's any need to compete for a bigger Sunday morning crowd anywhere. I think if we just leave Sunday mornings up to God and whoever's here is here, whoever's not here is not here, but if we could look for the people that A, either don't have a place they go to on Sundays or somehow are falling through the cracks where they are because maybe they go to a church and you're not allowed to suffer, that everything's victory and hype and then when you suffer, then you're out, you know, because you got to kind of construct this... This idea, I think it's okay for each of us to admit, uh, as Bonhoeffer says, we need to approach people in light of what they're going through, in light of what they're suffering. Viktor Frankl said this in one of his books, The Father of Cognitive Therapy. He said, I thereby understand the fact that being human is being always directed to a meaning to fulfill or another human being to encounter a cause to serve or a person to love. That we get in touch with uh, what you're going through so that you can uh, minister to others. 
The I for me this week stands for uh, I want my life to have meant something. I just want my life to count. And as it turns out, a little bit of research on my part uh, fleshed out some of this. Look at these numbers because I'm not the only one thinking this. The American Council on Education looked at 171,509 students. And the highest goal, 68.1% of them said developing a meaningful personal philosophy of life was their number one goal. Look at that. 68% developing a meaningful philosophy of life. Or Johns Hopkins University uh, um, looked at uh, 48 different colleges, almost 8,000 students. 78% checked the box that said, finding a purpose and meaning to my life is the most important thing. Only 16% said their number one goal was to make a lot of money. It's interesting, isn't it? That we are creatures that long for meaning. The University of Michigan looked at workers, people long uh, either didn't go to college or far out of college. Uh, 1,533 of them responded uh, and uh, in the order of importance. And good pay came in a distant fifth. In other words, money doesn't take trauma away. Money doesn't take troubles away, right? It's finding a purpose to live, a reason to live. Joseph uh, Katz said this then, looking at all the data that the University of Michigan produced, he said, the next wave of personnel entering the industry will be interested in careers with meaning, not money. I remember when we were uh, student pastors in Oklahoma and uh, God had really blessed there uh, and exploded the student ministry to hundreds and it's pretty amazing. And, um, but we received a call from the headquarters of the Assemblies of God Church, Central Assembly, Phil Wanamaker wanted to interview us. We interviewed and subsequently were offered the job and, and Darla was uh, busy doing something at University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma and couldn't travel. So I drove to to um, Springfield, Missouri from, from Oklahoma, near Oklahoma City, to hear the offer and, and to have one last conversation. And so I remember pastor was standing in my hotel room at the Howard Johnson's. That tells you how old, uh, how long ago that was. Standing there and uh, he tells me the total, how much they're going to pay. I mean, the church was bigger than this. Is, uh, the building was, the facility was bigger. And uh, he told me, I said, you know, pastor, I said, this is not, this is about half what we make in this little four red light town in Oklahoma. And I made whatever compelling speech you can make at 25, you know, and I was telling him this and he looks at me and he said, oh, that's, that's too bad. I, I guess you can decide whether you want to have money or whether you want to come and be a part of something bigger that could provide meaning for your life. Like, well, gee, I hadn't thought of it quite that way. You know, I remember the five and a half hour drive back home Goldman City, I'm like crying the whole way. You know, this is in the day before cell phones. And, and so, you know, I tell Darla that she started crying, you know, it was a half a, but we went, we took the job because we felt like there was meaningfulness and pur uh, purpose for us there. The last, the T today is, stands for um, teach me, God, about who you are. Because I thought you were one way. I thought we're the head, not the tail. No, that scripture didn't apply to us. I thought that we could declare victory and get a healing, that miracles were available to everybody. They may be, but they weren't available to my daughter. We didn't get a miracle. To watch her suffer with the cancer had moved into the bones and to hear just everyday things that were so painful for her. God, where are you, God? You know, the Bible says that he will never leave you or forsake you. And he didn't leave her. And he didn't forsake her, but he didn't ease her suffering on the way out. As far as we know, we get to heaven, maybe find out different, but it certainly didn't look like it. Even the medication, she was, the medications weren't touching it. It was dramatic and heavy and difficult. Not, not something that you really talk about much. 
It's not even so much I'm talking about it to be cathartic uh, for myself today. As I'm, I don't plan on getting in front of you on Sundays and doing therapy. But what I do plan on doing every Sunday is being honest about our life experience. Because God knew who we were. He knew the stage and the platform we had. And he chose not only not to heal, and not to bring about victory that way. She, there is victory. She's not dead. She is alive, but, but she's, dead. she's dead for us. She's not, she won't be at Thanksgiving dinner. There'll be, there'll be a spot at the table where she's not. Alan, I helped him get the U-Haul truck, and he sold the house. He's in Nashville this weekend. You know? That's the real, that, so teach me about who you are, God. Teach me. Because now I need the comforting God. I didn't want the comforting God back in last August, you know, or a year ago, August. I wanted the miraculous God. That's the one I was raised on. That's the one I was taught about. That's the one I preached about my whole life. But we didn't get a miracle. So what do you do when God doesn't do what you want? What, what I believe is that we're down to this place of Psalm 25.4 Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Because obviously you, God doesn't see things in our lives the way we see them. He sees things differently. Certainly there's the eternal perspective. And so we, we are forced to be okay with that. Whitney did um, 10 rounds of chemotherapy and lost her hair three times, I think it was, two or three times, stood up here bald, declaring the word of the Lord and, and professing. She never thought she was going to die. She thought her God was going to come through. He did come through, but not in, the way any of, not in the way she expected, not in the way we expected. I can tell you this. One thing I know for sure, that just having faith is not enough. You, you still are under the sovereignty of Almighty God. You are still under his oversight. You are still under all of that. And why we didn't get a miracle, I don't know. I doubt we'll ever have the answer. I don't know. I mean, I, I hope, but I do know this. My daughter did not lose her faith and kept her faith to the very end and looked at her brother and said, worship, worship. And now, literally pass the baton to us that compels us to say, are we now going to lose our faith? Or are there people in the audience that have children that got them to pray for Whitney every night that, that have to tell their children that Whitney wasn't healed, that those children don't lose their faith? What I can say to you is what Hebrews eleven six 6 says, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards them that diligently seek him. And so our reward is this suffering today. Our reward is the pain of a broken heart. We have to receive what God gives to us. And you also, in your journey, have to do the same thing. It's not like you really have options anyway, is it? So we are a people that are sheep that stand alongside goats. Can you put up that scripture for me from Matthew 25, I think it is? Uh, let me read that one. Uh, uh, let, me, let me read that. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet uh, and a light unto my path. Um, and did I send you Matthew 25? I sent it last week and I didn't get to it. Because uh, I, I feel like, um, if you could find it, Matthew 25, and uh, I'll tell you the verse. Um, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Matthew 25. I, I feel like it's important enough. Yeah, here it is. Let me... Uh, let me get you, I think it's 30, 31. I have to brighten my screen so I can see. Um, in the NLT, it says this, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with them, then he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left hand. And I think the thing that, uh, and I'm going to read the rest. I'll wait for them to get, get it up on the screen. I'll read verse, uh, if you get to verse 34, put that up. Um, but I think the thing that separates those of us that, um, 
that go through what Jesus said. He said, all is trouble. You're going to have trouble. I think the thing that separates is faith. Because I don't think, I, it requires a lot more faith now even than it did. I had, faith was really pretty easy for me to believe Whitney was going to come through this. Even four years ago when she first got diagnosed, I just knew she was going to come through. There were dreams and visions and prophetic words and, and, and I just believed that somehow God was going to make a way. She did the new immunotherapy where they put in cells and, and, it, and it worked and she was cancer free for about 45 days. And then the cancer just raged back in again. The reality is this, my friend. I don't know what storm will hit you, your life. I don't know what trauma may come. I hope none come. But I can tell you this, that when your faith is tested, you've got to really consider where you're at with the Lord. Am I a devoted bondservant follower of Jesus? Or only when things go my way will I follow him? And these are heavy, heavy decisions to make. That uh, uh, I'll read the rest of this. Verse 34 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then, of course, then they go back and forth and they ask him, well, when did we see you? But look at the trauma. I was hungry and you fed me. To be without food, not just food insecurity, to, to literally be in this city and be without food would create a trauma. Or thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, felt like a stranger. Do you, you see, like, the ministry that has fallen to our shoulders, or at least that the awakening of the ministry that is our responsibility is to say we are supposed to love the least of these. And once you've been wounded, once you, once you walk into a room and everybody in the room pities you, there you go. Sometimes they pity you because you're poor. Sometimes they pity you, but, but now we walk into a room of ministers and <laughs> we, can, we can feel we're like, oh, we are those people now. Because I've done it. It's like, oh, when someone's child would die or a DUI, a, a drunk driver took out a family member, I, would, I, was, I was concerned and I was sincere in my concern, but I did not feel the pain. So I think as a church, somehow what we want to do is settle into each of our individual pains and be honest with the Lord and say, teach me who you are in the middle of my pain. I want to know a greater revelation than what I just hear from Christian television. I want to I wanna know you. I want to know you not only in, in glory, but I want to know you in the sufferings. Who are you, Lord? You know, one of the things that Whitney told me several times early on, I mean, honestly, I'm just being honest with y'all, we did not contemplate that we were going to lose her. That's how we were just... We weren't even mechanical. We just knew we were going to get a miracle. I just knew it. Now you say, my brain couldn't process what we're going through now. It's possible. Could be, could be a block or a shut off. And some of you who had lost people to cancer try to speak that word to us. And man, I didn't want to hear it because I, I didn't want to deal with that. I'm going to stay in faith, right? This is how we're taught. We stayed in faith. Whitney stayed in faith. We didn't, we didn't get the result that we thought we were going to get. So now, so now we're left to kind of sit in the ashes here and say, okay, God, like, what is the, what's the purpose of our life? What is the, what is this plan that you have for us? What is this, what is this teachable? What is this nature? Is God still nice? Is God still kind? If I, the earthly father, if I, if I saw someone laying on the pavement in a car wreck and I had the ability to help them, I would help them. So, so it's a lot harder to sing good, good father now because of what we've experienced. We will sing it. I'm not throwing that out. I'm just saying 
this is our experience. And so I think we're maybe better equipped than we realize to reach a hurting, jaded group of people in America that have heard all the one-liners and they didn't work for them, that we are still a people of faith no matter what comes our way, that we will follow him. Think about this. My wife told me this early on when we were first few weeks. He said, I will baptize you with, with the Holy Ghost and fire. Anybody want to be baptized with fire? I thought fire meant something else. No, we're in the fire. You can't pull us out of the fire. We have to go through the fire. We're in the fire. And uh, uh, Claire shared with us uh, earlier this morning uh, that Viktor Frankl said, those that burn brightest are in the fire, basically. That those whose lights shine, they're shining because they're burning. They've been through some stuff. I know, I know many of you have been through hell. You've been through challenges in your life. You've lost your jobs. You've had stuff fall apart. But I'm here to tell you this morning, there is a God that we can't control, but that we can serve and humble ourselves under. And he is a God that will not leave us. He is a God that will not forsake us, even though he doesn't give us what we want. He's still a God that is with us. And Whitney told me several times, I don't know if I finished the sentence, I interrupt myself sometimes. I, she said to me, the only word I had from God is that he'll be with me. That he'll be with me. That was her word. She was going off all of our other words. And early in her cancer, within days, she said, pray that I have endurance. I thank God that she endured four years so that you and I could watch her burn for the glory of God. And we will not let that sacrifice be in vain. We will also use our pain to burn for the glory of God. And so baptize us with the Holy Ghost and fire. Let your fire, we didn't, I didn't want this fire, but now that it's here, consume up all the dross, consume up anything in me that needs to be burned out that I might be purified to be made more and more and more like the Father. So I want to give you four things, four takeaways from you today, and I'll wrap it up with this. Number one, if you're in this this is what I wrote in my journal. To know myself on the worst day of my life is to find my path. Now this is the path. God knew who we were. Not that we were anything special, but he knew the platform we had. That's what I mean by that phrase. I'll make sure I have to clarify. because That's what I mean by that. He knew we had the microphone at a place of influence, and he knew what our hearts would go through, and he knew what we would be saying to you. And this is a message that he wants coming through our lips to your ears. And so to know myself on the worst day of my life, to say, okay, this is my path. Number one, take inventory of the situation. You need to journal it. You need to write it down. Whatever traumas, whatever things you're going through, you need to get them down on paper. You need to write, I don't care. Say, I'm not a journaler. I don't care. If you're in a situation, you need to start writing it down and talk to the Lord about it. Number two, decide where you're gonna put your trust. Are you gonna trust him or not? And that, you, that's not like an easy decision. You have to make up your mind. You have to decide, am I going to trust God? I believe you'll come to the conclusion we have that yes. Thirdly, you want to locate yourself on the map of life. Where are you? You're in your 20s, you're in your 30s. Where, where are you on the map of life? What does this look like for you? Where are you in the context of it all? And number four, to listen for God on the worst day of your life is actually a prayer for God to guide you. To pray any kind of a prayer and to listen for an answer on the worst day of your life is to say, God, we need some guidance here. We need your help here. <laughs> we need your ministry here. It may, be, it may be some time before we have any perspective 
But we may not ever have perspective. I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. I don't know. But what I know is that there is one who has never changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's not just a one-liner. It's this. It is to say I, there were aspects of who God is that I did not know about. And now I have to be teachable. Say, Lord, I want teach me your ways. Teach me your ways so I can not only rightly preach the word, but also rightly live your purposes for my life. I know that God is up to something in your heart. I know I can feel it. I can sense it. If I felt like this was just me up here uh, belly aching, and, then I, I wouldn't do this. I, I don't, I don't need, need this. I feel like God is doing something in our church. He's shifting our hearts around this to say, I still want you to believe and pray. I still want you to believe in miracles. I still want you to pray for the sick. I still want you to do all these things. But at the foundation level, I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth. And truth means that you have to be honest about who God is and who God isn't. And just because he's the God of the impossible doesn't mean you will always get what you want. But it does mean he is still the God of the impossible. And we follow him and we serve him wholeheartedly. Amen? Stand to your feet. Go ahead. Let's stand to your feet. I want to speak a blessing over you. In fact, close your eyes for a moment if you would. Just close your eyes. I want to speak this blessing over you. Holy Spirit, just speak through me. In the old days, the, the leader of that service, the spiritual director of a service, would speak a word over those that were in attendance. And they would receive it to themselves. They said, oh, that was for me. I would receive it. And I want you to receive any aspect, any part of this that is for you. I want you to receive it. I bless you in the powerful name of Jesus who has defeated every demonic element in the universe, the one above and the one beneath. I bless you in the name of Jesus who has all authority. I bless you in that name which carries a substance to it that no other name has. I bless you in the name of Jesus today. I break off nightmares and bad dreams and predictions of your demise. I break that off. I break off any spirit of suicide that has attacked your own heart. I break off those that have been so discouraged about overcoming an addiction to heroin. I break off that discouragement and tell you to cling to those around you and cling to your God. I bless you with a reality check that you would be grateful at Thanksgiving in a way that you've never been grateful before. And I bless you with gentleness of heart that you will love the disenfranchised and love those who are hurting and wounded and angry, that you will love them with the love of the Lord. And I bless you with peace, peace of mind, peace of heart. I bless you with eternal blessings that far outweigh monetary blessings. I bless you with peace, and I bless you with purpose, and I bless you with energy to live for the Lord in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise for his word today. Amen. All right. Join me next week. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody.